Hey there, my name is Patrick, and today on Patrick Creates, I figured we would go back to Animal Crossing New Horizons, and this time go over five more design tips that are a bit more practical and a bit less based on design. So these are five tips that you should be able to implement immediately on your island to add depth and create a little bit more visual interest. If that sounds good to you, let's get right into it. So let's start off with something that's a super quick fix. I see a lot of people, when they are getting ready to create flower beds and gardens and things like that, decide to section off their flowers by color. So if I had a lot of orange flowers, this would mean that I take all those orange flowers and I put them in one flower bed. And while there is a lot of variety in the orange flowers in the game, what this can lead to is a flower bed that looks kind of blocky and sort of flat. So what will happen is that it takes up a lot of visual space on your screen. I also see a lot of people use a checkered pattern where they take complementary colors of flowers and kind of create a checkered pattern with them. And whereas that looks a little bit more energetic and a little bit more lively, it also kind of feels very busy and your eye is sort of just bouncing around this pattern trying to figure out where to go. I try to use flowers in a way that helps somebody move through a space. And I don't necessarily mean just outlining a path or sort of creating a border around an area. I do this by using a gradient. So let's see how it works. Okay, so here's an abstract example of what an orange flower bed would look like. And you can see while the tones of orange vary slightly, overall the image still feels very flat and your eyes don't really travel when you look at it. They just kind of look at this one block of color. And now here's an example of a checker pattern using orange and purple flowers. Immediately you can tell that there's a lot more energy in this image, but your eye doesn't necessarily travel because there's no visual priority. Instead, you're kind of bouncing around and trying to find something to focus on. And now here's an example of a gradient. Your eye is probably drawn to the warmest or the coolest color of the image. But unlike the other examples, it's very easy to follow the movement of the color. Your eye just naturally knows how to follow the progression of colors based on the way that they're laid out. So this is the benefit of using gradients. Your eye just knows where to go. It's almost like you've laid down arrows and subconsciously your visitors know how to navigate your space because you're following the flow of color that you've set up in your flowers. And if you're dead set on staying monotone and just using one color, you still actually can use gradients. So in this example, I've laid out all of the white flowers from warmest to coolest. Using gradients might feel like a very subtle change on your island, and that's kind of the point. By using gradients, you're creating a very smooth look to your island that's very pleasing to the eye, but at the same time, as you move through space, it's constantly changing. And plus, if you use gradients, you may also have the subconscious benefit of creating some directional guidance for your visitors and villagers. This next tip is another one that's focused on creating depth on your island, but honestly, it's something that's used in all forms of design. That is the rule of three. And without getting into too much detail, it is just widely believed that three is a golden number in design that is more satisfying, structured, and effective when creating content or media. Which, that was three things, by the way. <laughs> the rule of three is also heavily used in interior design. So three pictures just seem to look nicer on a wall than two, and three lights over a kitchen counter seems to somehow look better than four. And for whatever reason, by clustering three little knickknacks together, it's more appealing than having just a couple. In the same way, you can apply the rule of three to your island as you design spaces. Here are some examples. Ike is a cranky neighbor that I have that lives in basically a tool shed. Inside of his house is very utilitarian, so I decided to bring some of that outside too. In the front of his house, I paired a smoker with a metal can and a butter churn. And this is a very straightforward example of how clustering three objects together can create visual interest that leads you into a space. In this area, I've created a little nook where these two neighbors have their yard defined by sets of threes. So when you enter the space, you're greeted by two clusters, and then the space is kind of capped off with a third. This is a very symmetrical example of how three objects can define a space. And this is a very asymmetrical example of the same. And finally, here's a more complex example where I've used multiple clusters in one space. 
So I'm sure you can see the rule of three isn't necessarily a rigid one. It's definitely up for interpretation, but this is a great place to start when you're designing a new space. Or if you're already creating a space and it doesn't quite feel right, maybe consider ways that you can cluster objects in groups of three to see if it helps. I have a little bone to pick with Animal Crossing. <laughs> Whereas we do have a lot of objects to decorate with, it seems like one of the areas that we're lacking is smaller objects to kind of help add detail to an area. And even the ones that we do have seem to take up a full tile, like this coffee cup. Why? So it makes it hard to group objects together to create things that feel more detailed and kind of like special or, or lived in. One of the ways I've gotten around this is by using common objects or resources like clay, wood, tree branches, those things to add detail to an area. And this is actually something I've done since Wild World, but in New Horizons, we have so much more that we can play with. And the best thing about these items is that you can just step right over them. So, you know, if you're working in tight spaces, using a tree branch on the ground or a stone to create some rubble, you're not really taking up any of the walkable space. I actually feel like the game is encouraging us to create microenvironments using these resources because we're literally creating objects out of them. <laughs> so there's no shortage of DIYs that look like a tree trunk or you know just a big hunk of stone. And when you pair them together with one of these resources sitting next to them, it kind of just looks nice. It looks like it's supposed to be there. So let's check out some examples. So in this forest area next to my house, I decided to construct the campsite. I put a few objects around the campsite to make it feel more homey. Like I put the cot down and the small generator with a gas tank in the back. And I also decided to move towards a glamping experience <laughs> with this huge brick oven behind the tent. And just besides the oven, I put the pile of wood DIY and I paired it with the hardwood resource, just sitting right next to it on the ground. And to me, this adds more detail and still makes sense from a practical standpoint. Like it would definitely make sense that there is some wood sitting next to the wood, <laughs> but it looks different. Over here, I created a little pottery workshop for my neighbor because she decided that she wants to start selling her work as a side hustle. The area is kind of peppered with different pottery DIYs that she's worked on. And I also made a decision to put some clay on the workbench. And this makes it feel a little bit like she's beginning her next project as she's working between sales. This area is a tourist attraction and it's meant to feel aged, sort of like the spot predates Tom Nook's acquisition of the island. In the corner of this little display area, I dropped some stone resources to make it look like the stone fence had kind of worn down and pieces had broken off over time. And then finally, here's an example of a lost item that I decided to steal. I love the book object that we have in the game, but this lost object just feels a little bit more special, a little bit more personal. Plus the area is really tight and I want it to be easy to get into the chair. And what I imagine is that at the end of the day, my neighbor is feeling a little reflective. So she comes to her backyard and she listens to the very calming sounds of the waterfall and writes in her journal. I also used to love doing this with seashells and new leaf, but for some reason, seashells place as one of two generic objects in this game despite having their own unique icon illustrations. But that's for another video. So I would recommend thinking about ways that you can use these common objects and lost items to create a more nuanced detail on your island. And just a reminder, they're super great if you're working with tight spaces. Sometimes after you've spent like 20 minutes laying down a path in an area, you take a breather, you step back, you run through, and you realize it still feels super flat. And unless you're creating space that has a lot of like variance and cliff height, this is just something that we need to overcome in this game. It can be tough to create depth with just objects and just scenery items because we're on a roller. So as you move through the space, the horizon is always visible in the distance. A great trick that I've learned to instantly add depth to an area is to accent your space with small water canals. And rivers and ponds in this game can still be pretty flat, but it's such an easy, natural looking way to break up a space while still adding visual interest. Plus, it's very helpful for gameplay. <laughs> so in this area, just beside resident services, I decided to create a village where most of my neighbors live. I started by using bushes and hedges to define their yards, and then I layered in some objects based on you know, their personalities. But it was still missing that extra something to make the spaces feel more organic and lived in. So I decided to put a canal just behind the most southern row of houses. And you really only notice it when you're walking through the neighborhood area 
and you get a peak between each of the houses. So it's kind of hidden and not a focal point, but it makes the area so much more believable. One important note is that the canals that I've made in this example are not fishable. To create a fishable pond in this game, it needs to be at least three tiles wide on each side. And in the examples that we're looking at, I've only made my canal two tiles wide. Pro tip, if you're not sure how big your pond is, you can try throwing some bait in the water. Uh, if the game doesn't allow you to throw bait, then fish won't spawn there. But one cool thing is that even though I can't fish in these canals, my villagers will. And so as I'm walking around, I still get to see my villagers fishing in these little canals and kind of filling up the street in their neighborhood. And it also takes up less fishable space that I would be using. <laughs> so, nice. One of my favorite updates to the game between New Leaf and New Horizons is the way that the game engine deals with light. And I can talk for literal days <laughs> about how beautiful the skies look and the sunsets and sort of all the environmental lighting, but for this tip, we're going to be focusing on the evening hours. This game really paid extra special close attention to creating super warm, inviting, and glowy, beautiful ambient light. And ambient light can mean a lot of things, but for our purposes, I'm referring specifically to the light that's emitted from objects in the game. So things like street lights, lanterns, table lights, you get it. I think the first example we see of ambient light is from our neighbor's home at night. Their windows and their porch lights just look so friendly and cozy because of the soft, almost hazy light that they're giving off. And the game doesn't stop there. As you walk away from light emitting objects, they ever so slightly begin to bloom in the distance. Light bloom in video games is an effect that's meant to reproduce how real world cameras react when pointed directly at a very bright light source. The easiest way to explain is that the camera sensor gets a bit overwhelmed with the amount of light coming from one point. So it causes an overexposed light flare on the final image. Light bloom was actually a lot more of a problem in older cameras, specifically in photographs or movies shot on film. And if you've ever heard of directors and photographers putting Vaseline on the lens during like the days of old Hollywood, that's why. Vaseline on a camera lens would filter the light coming into the camera and create a very flattering and glowy look. So in some ways, light bloom has a very nostalgic feel to it. But cameras nowadays usually have tech in place to prevent light bloom from happening. So if you take your iPhone and point it directly at the sun, this feature called HDR will kick in and that will help level out the different sources of lights that are happening. So you'll get an image that looks more true to how your eye sees it. And actually a lot of the light flares and sort of light leaks and things like that that we see in movies and TV today are added in post-production. And this makes it so the folks that are working on the media have more control over the light because that light flare, that light bloom is very unpredictable and can ruin an image. Video games often use this effect to create a more romantic or a more dreamy setting. So it fits really perfectly in the world of New Horizons. The first time I noticed this bloom effect was on my fountain DIY. This was one of the earlier DIYs that I came across, so I made it immediately and gave it a home. And to my surprise, when nightfall came, I was running around and I noticed that this object reflects a super pretty, kind of startling looking blue moonlight as you walk by. And surprisingly, so does this solar panel <laughs> and this vending machine. One downside to the ambient light in New Horizons is that it isn't rendered in real time, so you won't necessarily see the light that's coming from that lantern change the brightness of your character, but it sure is pretty. The way the moon casts our island in these beautiful blues and purple shades is definitely, definitely something special, but I would encourage you to think of ways that you can also use this ambient light to make your islands feel just as lively as night as they do during the day. So those are five more tips that you can use when designing your island in Animal Crossing New Horizons. If you liked any of these tips, please let me know in the comments below. I would love to hear. If you like this video, please feel free to like it. Um, and if you want to know more about how I play Animal Crossing or see any updates about my town or get more information on how you can decorate yours, please feel free to subscribe because I think I'm going to be doing this a little bit more often. And that's it for today's video. Talk to you guys next time.